Hi, good morning. Welcome to One Million Cups. I'm uh, one of the organizers. I'm Milton. I'm here with Britton, Courtney. And as we're getting started today, um, we want to do a great big welcome to one of our newest organizers, Zach Pettit. <laughs> welcome to the team, Zach. Um, I believe Zach is a recent graduate of UMKC, new member of the Bloom team. So part of a great uh, startup that's doing a lot of great things here in Kansas City and expanding quickly. So again, welcome to the team. So kind of a light crowd today. I want to welcome you guys for braving the weather and coming on out. So I've got to ask, who's here for the first time? Wow. Welcome. Welcome. All right. So. For the first time visitors, uh, One Million Cups is essentially a program created by the Kaufman Foundation. Essentially, each week we have two presenters come. Um, they'll tell, tell us for about six minutes about their journey um, and their new endeavors, their company, um, and just being an entrepreneur. And from there, we open it up to the audience for Q&A for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, typically, that Q&A is led by our expert panel. And I'd like to have our panelists today just stand up for a moment, introduce yourself, and tell us who you are. Good morning. Here's what I like. For, for those of you who it's your first time, this is maybe the smallest crowd I've ever seen. I think Here's so. what I like about this, though. That means you guys are going to have to ask really good questions <laughs> to make up for the lack of bodies. So no pressure. Uh, my name is Grant Gooding. Uh, I own a positioning firm here in town called Proof Positioning, where we help entrepreneurs take the guesswork out of how to differentiate themselves from their competition using math and science. Dan Schmidt, I guess, uh, like he said, lots of qu good questions today, lots of opportunities to be heard. Uh, with Emerging Business CFO, we provide a virtual CFO, COO solution for startups and growth stage companies, basically try to take some of the daily operational workload off of founders and entrepreneurs so they can focus on building their company on a strategic level. Thank you. So we saw all of our first time visitors. Let's, let's see the hands for some of our One Million Cups veterans that are here every week. All right, well, welcome today. Thank you guys so much for coming. So we're gonna keep things moving. We want to welcome to the stage um, Matt Chate Chateau of Chateau Milk Company, a company that has literally brought the milkman back. Let's welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Well, if I would have known and had some forethought as it relates to the temperature and everything else, I would have brought hot chocolate for everyone, specifically knowing the size of the crowd. But, um, first and foremost, just thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. Thanks for um, coming and having a willingness to listen to our story. So there's a differentiation as it relates to who we are. Our first and our core company has always been Chateau Milk Company. Um, and then what we're really focusing on and talking about today is, is what we've released in the last couple of months, and that's a company called Chateau Home Delivery. So I am Matt Chateau. I'm the founder of Chateau Home Delivery. Left the corporate world in January of this past year. Um, to come back and to start taking over the process of Chateau Milk Company and then also to try to introduce a few new businesses that we have in the pipeline. The first being that of, of home delivery. So to give you a little background of kind of how this all started, Chateau Milk Company began in 2003. Um, it was, we had no choice actually. Commodity prices were going up, milk prices were going down. It doesn't take a genius to understand that that doesn't work from a financial perspective. So we wanted to do something new and we created an uh, on-site vertically integrated company focused really on three things, to offer the Kansas City metropolitan area with the absolute best dairy products that possible, to two, provide a premium customer service experience that we really don't believe that is found with any other company in our space and, and specifically in the region, and then three, to back that up with transparency, to allow customers to truly understand where their products come from, how they get from our cows to your, <clears throat> to your grocery store and then to your home. Um, so over the course of that period of time, since 2003, we've been very fortunate in the fact of receiving numerous national and international awards for product quality, as well as for business innovation, that type of thing. So how does all this relate to talking about home delivery? Well, through the process of the last 13 years, we've had a lot of people that have asked us for new products, whether it be fun flavored milks, whether it be yogurt, whether it be cheese, A's cheeses, cheese curds. But one of the things that have been consistent as far as the request for the past 13 years is, when are you gonna provide home delivery? These glass bottles are somewhat difficult for me to get from my home to the grocery store and back because there's a deposit on the bottles. Can you help us out? Can you do something that allows us to even more so enjoy your products on a weekly basis? 
since 2007, when we really started thinking about home delivery, we always thought, you know, what a great idea, but we're really not set up to do it. So um, we then, as I left the corporate world last year, decided to ask ourselves the question is, is there really a need for the milkman again here in the Kansas City metropolitan area? And as we started evaluating that question, we found out, you know what, there's really no direct consumer milk delivery. There's really no one-stop location for top of quality local products. They really have no old-fashioned experience that you got to experience whenever the milkman came to your door decades ago. And today, as we all know, as parents and as just people in general, time is such an important component of our daily lives. And so, you know, convenience is, is extraordinarily important to all of us. So in October, we began to do a test market of home delivery, bringing back the milkman to Kansas City. We did that in the Leavenworth area uh, for numerous reasons that we can talk about more if you'd like. Um, in November, because it was so successful in October, we decided to go live. So in November, we offered four routes within the Kansas City metropolitan area. Today, we have more than 3,300 res registered customers on our platform. We're serving about 254. So we can talk about that too as it relates to scale process and everything else. And on a weekly basis, we're adding new routes. We're getting new trucks from our uh, manufacturer in, in Providence, Rhode Island. So that's kind of where we're at today. So how does this work? How are we any different? So it's pretty simple. Everything is an online platform. So just like what you would think of as far as using Amazon or somebody like that, you basically go on our site, you determine whether or not you want to sign up for our service, you register. Assuming that we have a route available in your area, you get excited and you think, you know what, I think I want to have not just Chateau Milk delivered to my door, but I want to have a handful of the other 400 plus local high quality products that we offer delivered to my door as well. You set up your recurring order, um, you customize that for the specific week that you're going to get your delivery, and then what we do on the back end is start working with our suppliers, all local in nature, um, picking those products, getting those to our farm, and then the next day delivering them directly to your doorstep. Um, <clears throat> through that process, we have a couple of different options. You can get the, the old-fashioned metal milk box if you'd like, or you can use your own cooler. But the bottom line for us is just making sure that whatever it is that you use is able to maintain a temperature. In today's world, it's not so bad with temperatures of negative or 20 degrees with a windshield of the negative nature. But in the summertime, that becomes more and more of a concern for us. So what makes us different? There's a lot of conversation about home delivery nationwide, whether it's Amazon doing something by drone or whether there's all these other pop-up home delivery companies that are seeing venture capital money being pumped into them through, throughout this region as well as many others. We think we are distinctly different. Um, we have exclusive rights to most of the top quality of category products in Kansas City. Um, so probably 97% of the products that we offer cannot and will not sell to other home delivery companies within this region that would compete with us. We think we offer the best dairy products possible that any home delivery company could ever offer in Kansas City. We're a little biased in that regard, but nonetheless, we obviously control the brand of Chateau Mill Company. Um, we believe, and we didn't understand this really until we did some outside research, we believe that the experience that is offered by the milkman is dramatically different than that of either a drone or an 18-year-old jumping off of a minivan dropping something at your doorstep. And our customers are telling us on a weekly basis, and honestly, it's something that we underestimated. And then the last thing is we're tr continuing to try to redefine what outstanding customer service is for our customers. What are the next steps? I'll breeze through this really quick because I think I'm about out of time. Um, we're obviously continuing to offer new routes. Again, we're having 3,300 customers that have already signed up, serving 250. Um, we have a lot of growth and a lot of scaling to do. We're gonna do that in a really controlled manner because what we wanna do is we wanna make sure through that growth, we do not compromise our commitment to both our customers and our suppliers. And through that process, we also wanna make sure that no matter what additional products we begin to offer, that they are in line with the same high standards of the products that we offer today. And then the last thing that I'll touch on is, and I don't wanna understate this whatsoever, we truly believe that we have a role and a responsibility in this community of connecting our customers and the people to the people that are providing the other products, the other suppliers. Because it is not just Chateau Milk that we're providing, it is, it is greens, it is coffee, it is bacon, it is eggs, and we wanna make sure that those suppliers get the opportunity to meet the customers that we're, we're uh, working with on a daily basis. So with that, I'll close, and I'll ask you if you're ready to bring the milkman back to your specific porch in Kansas City. Thank you, Matt. I'd like to open it up uh, to our panelists to start with the questions uh, first, please. Then we'll open it up to the audience. The on switch. Gotcha. 
Uh, thanks for showing up. Great presentation. Uh, we love seeing companies that are successful that have circled back and gone and started something new again. So they grow and then cycle back and new and grow and cycle back. Um, one of the things I hear consistently in the local food ecosystem is the lack of distribution channels, the lack of being able to connect the, the vendors and the customers. So I'm curious as to how, kind of what the back end of that looks like for you. Did you find an off-the-shelf system? Did you develop something? If you develop something, do you have any plans to spin that off and actually provide that to other cities or other areas? Yeah, so great question. I'll take it in two parts. Specifically related to our back end site, we're using a, a system that's developed by a company out of Colorado and we will use that for the short term. Obviously, that's the easiest can version for us to get up and going, and then as we get going, and as we scale, <coughs> we'll probably make the effort of making our own investment and creating our own back end, whereby we can separate ourselves from them. Um, as it relates to scaling outside of the Kansas City Metro, I mean, heck, we got, we got tenfold growth just to catch up with where we're at today, and we've done no PR marketing, really, for, for what we've gotten. Um, but yeah, uh, we're not shying away from the idea that there's other markets outside of Kansas City that. I think could benefit from the service that we're offering. So Matt, thank you for presenting. Just, for the sake of clarity, right, I'm trying to segment and separate Chateau as a company to this is a new service segment that you're discussing with us today. So um, <clears throat> making sure that we're focusing on that, not only for us, but for the, the, the audience as well. So um, normally when someone creates a some type of a growth segmentation, whether it be product, service, or otherwise, they don't really do it correctly, right? They a lot of times what they do is they dilute themselves to some extent, and you have done the opposite. So I'm going to say something I rarely ever say, which is I really really like this. Well, thank you. Um, you're you're doing something that is was done and went away because. Eh, and so there's a model there that people understand. So you don't really have to educate them as to what a milkman is. Right, you're just saying, hey, look, we're going to specialize. I mean, the brain gravitates towards specialization. Sure. So the, the only thing that I saw that kind of made me cringe a little bit is when you said coffee and bacon, because that's not who you are. Right. You're the milkman. We are, and so I think that as we look back and we think about what history you did with the milkman, the milkman was not just an individual that dropped a, in that time frame, a quart of milk on your porch probably twice a week. They also became known for the idea of providing access to local products. And we don't think about that so much because we think about a guy with a white hat with a black brim that walks around carrying a milk crate. Um, and so what we knew though when we started this service was that it had to be broader than us to really be successful. We can go ahead and deliver 80 stops, 125 stops a day for a milkman dropping off just Chateau products. The bottom line though is that's not going to get us to where we need to be as it relates to a per stop sales amount. And so in order to make this successful financially, and it kind of worked hand in hand with what our belief structure is, that is that we really wanted to partner with what we thought of as top of brand categories in Kansas City. Okay, so to that end, so we're talking about a math problem yeah, then, right? Okay, absolutely. so uh, that's, that's the real hurdle here because you're about to make that problem, you're about to make that mistake I was just talking about to some extent. So you make sure, you know, make sure and understand that and mitigate that. Like, you, people know exactly who you are, right? That's why you're winning awards. That's why, you, that's why you've received the growth. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, in order to execute this one thing that we're trying to do here, I need to change myself in order to do it and, and, and make sure that the math makes sense. Sure. And that could be a big mistake. Well, and, and, and I appreciate the comment. So I think from our standpoint, what we want to do is, is two things. While we're using a similar logo and while we're going to play off of the idea of Chateau Mill Company, what we also want to know, understand is fundamentally what the world is today. So if you look at Hy-Vee Delivery, you look at Amazon, you look at other competitors in the marketplace, what they're trying to do is they're trying to set up a, a system by which they can scale quickly and then sell themselves off to a major brand, right? That's not what we have in mind as far as what we want to do, but what we do want to do is not only provide our customers with the opportunity of convenience to get Chateau Milk Company products, but we also do want to provide opportunity for others. And being Chateau Home Delivery, a separate business, and I, again, I'm not going against what it is you're suggesting, I absolutely agree, I don't believe personally that we're diluting that brand by offering other high quality equivalent products in different sectors. So you don't think attaching the Chateau name to it, which people recognize as being a dairy product, is being diluted by offering things that are non-dairy products? No, because I think that the differentiation on our truck is you can select 
any host of our 140 Chateau Mill Company products that we offer, and you can expect that quality that you've expected whenever you've picked it off the hy shelf or the Price Chopper shelves, and you can get that experience of the milkman. But at the same time, what we're hearing from our customers is, we're so thankful that you're giving us an opportunity to find brands that we never otherwise would have found. Take, for example, Maps Coffee, who I think is presented here. Vincent's a good guy. And Vincent obviously has a location in, in Lenexa. And Vincent makes wonderful coffee. But the fact of the matter is, no one in Parkville would ever find Vincent, because Vincent is not in his price chopper in his, in his high V. So if I can give those opportunities to those customers in Parkville that otherwise wouldn't have had that exposure to Vincent and his products, then I look like a hero, right? It's a win-win for us, it's a win-win for our customer in the fact that not only is Chateau Home Delivery providing us the absolute thing that we want from a convenience standpoint, but they are also providing us an avenue to get products that we never would have gotten before. So in that regard, do you think it's, um, and I'm sure you've thought of this to some extent, but I'd like to hear your answer, that it makes more sense to create a new brand that doesn't dilute your successful company right now and say, hey, look, we are a home delivery discovery brand that helps you find local business owners that have great high quality products. And oh, by the way, Chateau happens to be one of them. Yeah, so we thought about that a lot, and, and we had this conversation a lot with our, with our PR team and everything else. The problem that we have that if we create an additional brand, we no longer are the milkman, right? So we no longer create that experience. If I create, I don't even know. Not the milkman. Well, well, no, but, but I think do, do some research as it relates to what was happening in the 70s and 80s whenever the milkman left. And actually look at the milkman that still exists in Providence, Rhode Island, Denver, Colorado, the West Coast. You have milkmen that have been in existence since the late 1800s, and they do nothing more than provide their products in addition to, again, in most cases, high quality local brands. In some cases, they become moving grocery stores, which I don't support that concept, but in many cases, they've kind of just transitioned from what they have been in the past decades to doing what, they've, what they did there then and what was successful to doing that today. So I think it's a misnomer to suggest that the milkman didn't deliver other products other than milk in the 50s and 60s. That's absolutely fair, and I didn't know that, right? So personal ignorance, but what you have to be careful of is does everybody else also have that same feeling? Like, I thought the milkman just delivered milk. What? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I mean, I don't know if anybody else knew that milkmen delivered anything other than milk. I mean, I didn't know. So, but, but, that's, but that's a real variable that you have to deal with in the marketplace, sure. right? Well, and I think that one other thing that you said earlier that I'll touch on, um, is the idea that we don't have to re-educate the consumer as it relates to what the milkman is. And I think that's somewhat untrue too, because I think to even this conversation, there's a lot of people that we go to their homes and they're like, we're so excited, it's home delivery. And they put us in this blanket conversation as it relates to these broad-based home delivery companies that offer this whole variety of things. <clears throat> and they really have no concept of, of a milkman or what they did other than the grandma talked about it once or twice. So there is an educational process that we still have to overcome. Uh, just uh, one, I do remember, I was born in 1958, and my mother was customer in the dying days of the milkman. They delivered a lot of other things. In fact, they tried saving their businesses at the end by uh, line extension. In fact, there was a pretzel guy, there was a cookie guy, there was a bread guy in our neighborhood. Yep. They all kind of died in the mid-70s. One, what kind of margins does this business have compared to the retail channel? And related question, what kind of channel conflict have you run into with your retail channel? How do they feel about it? Great questions. So as it relates to, and I don't know specifically what the overall margins are for grocery establishments. Um, I know it's very, very different from department to department, but we, we look to get a margin about 40 to 45% on any product that we sell off the truck. Um, obviously, that's very different for a Chateau Mill Company product versus something else that we're buying. Um, as it relates to conflict and channel, that was something actually since 2007 that really kept us up and made us not want to move in this direction. Um, once we decided that we were going to move in the direction, we figured, you know what, we're going to be very transparent with our, with our retail partners and make sure that they're aware of what we're doing and make sure that there's no conflict. Probably four months ago, we went to a meeting in Providence, Rhode Island, where there's a number of different home delivery guys that were there, and we asked the question, how do you guys overcome this, this perceived conflict, and how do you make sure that your retail partners are not concerned about the fact that if you potentially taking business off of their shelves? And two guys quickly raised their hand and they said, it's been the exact opposite. We, we see that we're growing sales in their stores versus taking it away. And that was a little 
counterintuitive for me, again, not having been in the world, but um, it made sense after we had the conversation. So your, your home delivery truck is out in neighborhoods, you're, you're doing direct marketing as it relates to not just home delivery, but expanding the brand as well, so more people are getting to be aware of what it is you do and how you're different. But in addition to that, and we knew this going in, we are now targeting and attacking customers that on a weekly basis go to Walmart, Target, Costco, and Sam's to get their groceries, whereby they're never stepping foot in a price chopper, Hy-Vee, Hen House, whatever else you wanna talk about. And so through that process, we are, we're bridging that gap, we're providing them that service on a weekly basis, but let's not suggest that everybody is gonna know exactly what they need for the given week, and so if they run out of some up, where are they gonna to go to get it? They're not gonna to go to Sam's and Costco because they don't carry it, they're gonna to go to their high-end local retailers. Got a question here in the middle. Hey, hi, thanks for your presentation. My question to you is that, um, or thought is that, you mentioned your model, and then when you compared it to other delivery systems like Amazon's, et cetera, with our, which are the big boys, and then going back to the customer base locally, I thought that was a big jump and leap. There's a company you know, coming from Chicago, Peapot, <coughs> right, that delivers all over the place, and there's issues with that. Are you looking more of a scale of that purpose rather than the conglomerates or the big boys? I'm just a little <coughs> lost there. Yeah, so, so Peapot, very familiar with them. They're actually on the East Coast as well. Um, they're much bigger than what we intend to become. Um, while I make the comment that we'll look regionally and see what opportunities are available for us there, just like Chateau Mill Company, our, our initial focus and our main focus is to take care of the people within our community and being that of the Kansas City metropolitan area. And until we do that well, until we maximize those registrants that we currently have, then we're not putting our mind forward to talk about being a Peapod versus, dare I say Amazon, that's never gonna happen. But I mean, the whole conversation is, is focused on Kansas City for right now. Another question here in the middle. <laughs> Good morning, Bob King. My uh, wife told me when I was coming here, she goes, oh, our neighbors get that milk and we live in Leavenworth, so now I know why they do. Um, your conversation with Grant, first thing I thought of was, yes, people still do have a milkman, but it's ice cream and it's frozen dinners at Schwann's. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're trying to become a Schwann's. Instead of going in that direction, what about embracing the collaborative economy and maybe bringing the milk to the front place of a subdivision to their you know, uh, clubhouse and then have it distributed from there like Walmart is doing experiencing with home delivery. Sure, yeah, so I would disagree. We're nothing like Schwann's and we'll never be anything like Schwann's. Schwann's is based upon a frozen model whereby they get product from a distribution center somewhere within either this region or the United States. We are focusing about 85% of our efforts on the idea of fresh product. So you will never see that from Schwann's. But in addition to that, 100% of the products that we offer off of our truck are made in this Kansas City metropolitan area, 100%. And whenever we say local products, we don't expand the definition like some places do to say 250 miles, 500 miles. We think that's bogus. We, as a local dairy operation that's within 60 miles of Kansas City, we take a great offense to that. And so what we're doing and how we're very different from the models that you just suggested is we are focused on supporting the local supplier, therefore support, supporting the local consumer. As it relates to more of a broad-based delivery in a geographic area, we're not opposed to that whatsoever, as long as it doesn't make us lose that connection with our customer. Because one thing that we think, based upon the experience comment earlier, is our customers are growing through home delivery to not only appreciate the service and the products that we offer, but they're also growing to respect and enjoy the milkman being a part of their family. <laughs> I should have, right? No, no foresight. No, we didn't, but I would encourage you anytime anyone wants to come out to the farm, we'd love to show you around. You can kind of do a tour and we'll show you how we do things. Yes, ma'am. Like for the hen house, they pay you $2.17. Are they that worth that value? Well, so whenever you buy our milk at the grocery store or through home delivery, there's a $2 bottle deposit on a Chateau Milk Company bottle. Um, that's to promote recycle, reuse. It's also from our standpoint, from a business model to reduce our cost as it relates to packaging. Um, that's the same exact thing that we do through home delivery. So instead of taking it back to the store, you put it in your milk box, our milkman picks it up, you get a credit to your account. To kind of follow on with that, we had a Twitter comment. Um, someone was asking the question, how does the home delivery, home delivery possibly help the in-store sales? Yeah, so I'll reflect on the comments that I made earlier. It, it, we've never, as Chateau Milk Company, ever did any type of 
of outward marketing. I mean, we just have been very fortunate in the fact that we haven't really had to spend a dime on marketing outside of just package design and those types of things. And so with that, we really don't go seek new customers. Well, this is the first time that we've ever, in a roundabout way, in an indirect way, are going out and seeking customers, and that's through home delivery. So through that, we are exposing ourselves and, and allowing other people to, expose to be exposed to the Chateau Mill Company brand for really the first time. That's kind of an interesting comment. I, I was actually gonna refer this one to Greg, go ahead. <laughs> I, I mean, I was right there. <laughs> go please, ahead, you got it. please repeat this. There are lots and lots of existing business owners and startup business owners that need to understand this. When you specialize in something, and create a powerful brand, people will buy and you don't have to sell to them. So please repeat what you said again about not having to spend any money on marketing and advertising other than just exceptional products. Yeah, so I mean, and I think the comment was made earlier in a side conversation, our belief structure and our marketing strategy has always been to get our product in the customer's mouth because we believe it speaks for itself. And really, we have not spent any money at all in marketing in 13 years. We are very fortunate to have a wonderful uh, PR firm that we work with as our brand packaging, and we've decided that because we, you know, we're poor dairy farmers, right? In 2003, when we got into this, we, we had no money, we were losing money. And so what we tried to do is capitalize on the shelf space that we got and use our bottles as really kind of our marketing tool to tell our story. And so we've done that all along the way. Now we're a little bit unique in this fact too, whereby a cookie company can just buy more flour and sugar and make more cookies. It's not so easy for us, right? We have to buy more cows to produce more milk, and because we need more cows, we need more pasture ground, and because we need more pasture ground, we need more feed. And so there's a little bit more complexity as it relates to what we do and what we have to do in order to grow. But um, realistically, we've, we've never spent money in marketing for that simple fact. Got a question here in the middle. Actually, mine was more of a comment. Um, I'm from Green Dirt Farm, and I'm the director of sales and we found that it's very easy for us to promote products through Whole Foods and things like that. But sort of the outlying grocery stores where we may have a couple of clients that want our product but not necessarily so many, it's been difficult to keep the product fresh in those stores. So this is a really exciting model to see uh, for those of us who are creating those high quality products in Kansas City and some of the distribution channels aren't working very well for us. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you for the comment. Question on your left. Good morning. Thanks for your presentation. I'm, I too am old enough to remember the, uh, the bottles on the front step. Yeah. Um, so you had mentioned in your presentation um, 3,000 plus signups, but uh, serving 200 and so many. So is that, is that customer churn um, or can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, so it's really the story of our life, both from Chateau Mill Company as well as from Chateau Home Delivery. We created a product in 2003 where by our business plan said we would sell 100% of our milk in eight months, we did it in six days. And so we were playing catch up for really seven years as Chateau Milk Company. Um, the same has been true a little bit from Chateau Home Delivery in the fact that we have, we announced the service in early October or early November, late October. And just through the wonderful PR that we've gotten through news media and sharing the fact that what we're doing we've had people that have been unsolicited that have just gone on to register. So the vast majority of those 3,300 that are currently not being served are individuals that we just do not have routes in their specific area as of yet. Um, we honestly have like less than a 0.5% churn as it relates to our customers, so we're very fortunate about that. Follow-up question, you talked about your margins, which are pretty good for the food industry. You talked about a lack of marketing expense, so what's your break-even point? How much do you need volume to make this sustainable? Yeah, so um, great question. It depends a lot. There's a lot of variables based upon the route. So distance of route from, from home location, um, conversation about specific margins of, of a specific route, how many individuals are we delivering to on a specific route. So um, our pro forma is based upon, and it's very, very conservative, is based upon the idea of making deliveries in the round, range of about 80 per day with an average order delivery amount of about $25. At that point, I can make decent money. Um, we can easily do 130 stops a day, and I believe that we can get our average cart size somewhere in the neighborhood of 32 to 33 dollars. Matt, uh, thank you. We we are out of time, uh, so just two quick things. Um, we had a Twitter comment, and they said, you know, it would be awesome if you maybe considered partnering with Lamar's uh, Donuts. 
Lamar's Donuts, yeah. because then you can deliver their milk and donuts. Um, and lastly, uh, final question, as a community, what can we do to help you? Sure, well, on sort of the donut conversation, we may actually be working on something that can address their need. Um, so I was prepared for that. I, you know, I would take it a little bit differently, and I would say, what can we do to help each other? And from our standpoint, it's not me about talking about Chateau Milk or Chateau Home Delivery. It's me about talking about supporting other local suppliers. And I think there's a comment here from, from Green Dirt. I know that there's an individual here that represents some local tomato growers. I think it's all about the idea of stepping back and realizing that we have a responsibility to one another. And we have a responsibility to make sure that we are supporting one another in our community. So that's first and foremost. The second thing is, and it's really a pet peeve of mine, don't let people define local for you being 250 miles. That's baloney. Local is our community. 250 miles away is not going to help you create jobs in this community or make sure that you're getting the freshest products possible. The third thing, and probably the most important to me, expect something amazing. Don't be okay with somebody dropping something at your door and walking away and not having an experience associated with it. And then the last thing, selfishly, we would just ask for you to mobilize your friends and join us and bring them back to the North Atlanta Campus City. Thank you so much for your presentation, Matt. Thank you. Before we get to announcements, we would like to recognize one person and, and introduce them into our mug club. So if you've been here more than 10 times and have not received a mug, please raise your hand. Anyone? Milton? I think I've found someone here. Bob, if you want to stand up, uh, tell us who you are, what you do, what you like about One Million Cups, why we're so great. No, I'm just kidding. Before we present you with this mug. Okay. Right. My name is Bob King. My uh, business brand is Thought Spray Solutions, and I solve problems for businesses in marketing and strategic planning. I live in Leavenworth, and I drove through the snow today to get here. Thanks, Bob. Congratulations. I would like to welcome the One Million Cups team on the Kaufman side up to the stage. Um, I'd like to introduce Catherine, Jordan, and Brad. We have... Uh, three members of our team now, which we are really excited about, and I will turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Katherine Widrig. I'm Jordan Marcillo. And I'm Brad Chapman, I have my own mic. Uh, so we work here at the Kauffman Foundation on the entrepreneurship team, and we are program coordinators for One Million Cups overall. So our day-to-day -day consists of helping organizers in our 79 communities, or 78 communities as of today. We're launching in San Francisco uh, in about two hours. Um, helping them make their programs as strong as they can be. Uh, we visit sites as often as we can, interact with the audiences, interact with the organizers, um, and just experience the fun that 1MC has across the country. Thanks. Okay, so we have a few announcements and a few events this week. Um, Grant Gooding will be at the Sprint Accelerator twice today speaking about branding. Um, I think areas here from the Sprint Accelerator. Yep, she's in the back. So if you have any questions about the first two events on the page, please see her. Um, Think Big is having their collisions and coffee tomorrow morning. Um, that is a great program, so if you have time, please go check it out. Uh, Guild It, which is the 1MC for artists, is also hosting a program tomorrow. And then next week, Reverse Ed Pitch at the Sprint Accelerator. So the Lean Lab is seeking talent to help them out, so if you have time, please help them. And I would also like to welcome a former organizer onto the stage, Brian Azorski. He has a live announcement for you. I'll be joining the team again. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it's been about a month since I've been back here, so um, it's great to be back. Hey, um, some of you may have known, I, I started a crowdfunding meetup about two years ago, actually. It was January 2014. And we've kind of been on and off for the last couple of years, but we're transitioning into something a little different. The crowdfunding platforms have kind of changed a bit, the excitement's kind of died down. And so a buddy of mine, Lee Bales, who helped me start the crowdfunding meetup, and I are starting something called the subscription formula. And tomorrow at noon, we've got a um, live webinar happening online, and I believe it's gonna get tweeted by the 1MC uh, Twitter feed here in a second with a link. So if you're interested in um, having a monthly subscription service, 
uh, one of our past presenters, Lee Bales, shared his vinyl shirt club with us and had great success with that. He's also part of SOC 101, and they have a big subscription service as well. So we've got some free information available for you. So I'll be around a little bit after if you have any other questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brian. Good to have you back. We're good? Okay. I would like to welcome our second presenter, Michael Perry of Core 23 Biobank. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the organizers of One Million Cups and the Kauffman Foundation for having me. I really appreciate it. And I think this is a phenomenal platform. So um, as I said, my name is Michael Perry. I'm with Core 23 Biobank. And I'm here today to talk about stem cells. So first, um, who in the room is aging? Raise your hand. So this, this talk is relevant to all of us. Um, I'm gonna talk about our key core product is uh, cord blood and the stem cells that are derived from the cord blood. Um, and so what happens is when a pregnant mom delivers a baby, they have the opportunity to save that cord blood. And I'll give you the process first is uh, they simply go online, they enroll in a cord blood tissue or plasma banking program um, all through our website. And then we will send them a kit um, inside the kit is everything that the physician needs to do the collection. So um, three, there's different stem cells in the blood as opposed to the tissue. And we'll talk a, a little bit about that. Um, so this kit makes us a nationwide company. Um, we're not limited to just uh, Kansas City or Missouri or even the Midwest. Uh, we have patients from New Jersey to Florida. And um, so what happens is the physician is actually performing the medical procedure of collecting the stem cells after live birth. So they cut the umbilical cord, um, and then they will use a needle and a blood bag to uh, drain the blood out of the umbilical cord vein. This can be done for uh, after uh, delayed cord clamping. For all the hippies in the room, myself included, delayed cord clamping um, can be paired with cord blood banking. Um, particularly, the tissue is not affected by the volume of blood. Um, so the medical courier will actually go to the hospital and pick up the kit and the contents and then uh, next flight it out to our lab in Springfield, Missouri. And when it comes in to us, this is what it looks like. So it's all packaged up. You have the blood, the tissue, and the plasma, and then the maternal blood draw for the infectious disease panel. Um, so what Tayan is doing there is just assessing the preliminary quality of the unit, which is based on volume, uh, cell count, and sterility. Um, and so then after we process it, it goes into long-term liquid nitrogen storage. So we freeze it at minus 320 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So it's relatively cold. Um, and so kind of the, some of the basics, what is cord blood? Why do we care? Um, essentially, it's, a, it's like a bone marrow transplant. Technically, it's called hematopoietic progenitor stem cells. Um, but to anybody, it's, it's just a blood stem cell. Um, so what's so powerful and amazing is that there's currently over 80 different diseases that can be treated with cord blood, but there's all these up and coming clinical trials and applications like autism, cerebral palsy. This is on our website too, if you wanna look at it later. Um, uh, diabetes, heart disease, essentially you're regenerating the cells in your, in your body. Um, and so in 1988, there was one patient and one disease, and now in 2013, I think is when that statistic's from, there was 80 plus. Um, a lot more in the works right now with over 700 FDA registered active clinical trials uh, looking at these types of cells. Um, future potential, autism, one in 47 boys by age eight. So who can benefit? If I collect it for the baby, is it only for the baby or can it not be used for the baby? Great questions. Um, for that child, it's 100% match. But there may be a disease or a genetic condition where it would not be suitable to use your own. You'd want to use somebody else's, like a sibling. So when you think about the family tree, um, it can be used for parents. It can be used for siblings. It can be used for your children's children, which is not really what we're thinking about when we're um, expecting a new child is our children's children. So first or second degree relatives. Um, for the intention of treating all those different conditions. So um, the options, there's really three options that parents have when their child's born. Um, dispose of it as medical waste. So if you don't save it, either through public or private banking, the stem cells go in the trash. Um, 
the next option is public donation. Is that what we're on? Yeah, public donation. So there are programs in large cities, a very select few large cities, about 3% of the hospitals in the country, provide the ability to donate it to a public bank, kind of like the Red Cross, if you, if you donate blood. Now there's a whole host of complications and challenges facing the public cord blood banking programs, which is a different talk on a different day, but um, it happens to do with primarily graft versus host disease. Um, graft versus host disease is when there's histo incompatibility, which means rejection of your body to a transplant. Um, so um, then the next thing is private banking where you're storing it for your family. So if you store it for your family, uh, first and second degree relatives, that's your, your other option. So there's a few things that make us unique and different. Um, they're talking about the online FDA screening, which makes the um, uh, enrollment process really easy. Uh, we don't use harsh chemicals in our collection materials or the collection bags. Uh, we do have our own certified uh, class 1000 and class 10,000 clean rooms in our own lab. So a lot of companies are just marketing companies. They don't have their own lab. Um, and then all the different processing testing uh, kind of things. So Tyann is going to take you through the whole processing um, rigmarole, uh, which is about a six hour long deal. And she's going to do it, I think, in like five minutes. So um, she's going to move really fast there. And I will just um, kind of open it up for questions you might have about stem cells. So my presentations look like they're from the Stone Age compared to this. So great job in, in putting that together. Um, so this, exi like, this exists. Right, it has existed. I mean, like we, I, I've, I've only gone through the, the whole thing one time with one little one two years ago, and and we, uh, you know, we say I, I believe that the hospital we went through didn't have public, but we had private. They just asked us. There was a little five minute presentation from the nursing staff or whatever, and we saved it and we paid, however much it was. So, my concern regarding that is, well, it's already being done inside of these hospitals. Um, even if it's just private, they already have that relationship. So it could have been you. I really have no idea. I mean, it could have been your company. But if it's not, my concern is how are you going to be able to break into these large institutions and what is your competitive advantage? I heard one thing that might be, but I don't know. What is your competitive advantage over these existing relationships that they have? Because you're going to have to at least incrementally 1x the existing deliverable in order to be able to get that business. Yeah, so, the, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'll just address the, the, the latest one is, what is our competitive advantage? So, and it's, it's different for different people. So for mom and dad, our competitive advantage is that we store in multiple aliquots, which gives them multiple containers. So we don't put all the stem cells into one container, because you can only thaw it out one time. Well, to a mom and dad, that's relevant. To a hospital network, maybe don't aren't as interested. Um, so for hospital network, the fact that we're not just a cord blood bank, but we're also an adult stem cell bank. So adipose tissue, bone marrow, uh, platelet-rich plasma, uh, peripheral blood, and apheresis drive products, stem cell products. So for the 3% of the population um, that is pregnant, they can cord blood bank. For the 97% of the rest of us, we can't cord blood bank, right? And so we have to look at um, options for adults. So for hospital networks and joint ventures, joint partnerships, they're looking into the, the future of clinical applications and utility and what their needs are. They don't want to invest five to $10 million in their own laboratory processing facility. Um, they want to partner with us and have us take care of that regulatory and, and uh, financial burden. So, so yeah, but, but they're already partnering with someone right now currently if it's not you, right? So, because I agree with you, Right, um, and so when you said that we can break it into separate pieces, that could be a competitive advantage in the market. And, and, and is that easily repeatable by your competition? Can they go, oh yeah, well people like that, we could totally do that. 
and it's cost effective in order, and, and all of a sudden your competitive advantage just vanished. But is the fact that you, one of the things you said that I caught on to is you said, you, we own our own labs. Mm -hmm. And the other, the, your, your competition theoretically is, there, you said they were marketing entities. Yeah, so, well, there's, a, there's 28 companies in the country that do private banking. Um, and they're concentrated on the east and west coast. Um, so you could say, well, geographically in the Midwest, being the only company is that an advantage? It can be, particularly on the retail side. Um, so, so half of those 28 don't have their own lab. That is true. But what there's the, the competition that exists right now is more retail. Um, it's not these partnerships with the universities, the hospital networks. Um, there is almost very, 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 very little saturation uh, in the medical space because there's a, a long sales cycle to getting into a hospital network. Best case scenario, it's going to take you a year to solidify a strategic partnership with a hospital network. That's moving at light speed. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just complex in the sense that it, it's all different in different parts of the country with different networks and different universities. And so, um, as far as competitive advantage, um, uh, it's just different for different market segments. But good question. Thank you. Follow-up question on some of that. Uh, you, I looked at the website last night, by the way. It's just as well done as the presentation, so great job on that. Um, you talked on there about the recurring annual storage fees. So I'm curious as to what happens if somebody stops paying the fees. Does, do you have to dispose of the tissue at that point? Do you move it into a public health bank? And kind of as a, related to that, do you have a database for public health uh, use, or is it strictly private? Uh, the, the database is, is held by the NMDP and other such organizations. Um, if they stop paying, don't tell anybody, but we're, we don't move it. Because once it's frozen, once we've invested in it, it doesn't cost us anything. So worst case scenario, we wait 18, 20 years, and we ask the kid if they want to get it caught up for a discount. Um, there, so you cannot take a privately banked unit and move it into the public system. You're not allowed to. So. Question on your left. Good morning. Um, as a former chemistry lab supervisor in a high consequence setting, um, there's a couple things I see about your value proposition. Um, first one relates to the number of unforced errors in the delivery of medical uh, services, particularly in hospitals. And so a question would be, uh, what is your quality assurance regime or your performance assurance regime to make sure that you are on the positive side of that rather than the, you know, tag along with it? Um, and if, in fact, you are able to demonstrate consistently that you have a quality differential, uh, mightn't that become the essence of your uh, value proposition? So in order to determine a differential, you have to have a baseline. And while I would love for other companies to publish their statistics on um, uh, real, real credible statistics on recovery rates and by post thaw viabilities, a very uh, um, opposed to disclosing their, their data on that. But what I will say is uh, it, we're required to follow what's called GMP, uh, good manufacturing practices, or if you're familiar, good laboratory practices. So I can tell you um, the lot number, who checked it in, who received it, um, of, of every single reagent material product that has ever come in contact with that uh, cord blood unit. And I can tell you instantly, to run a report of every single technician that's touched it, every single test, every single uh, cryo vial or uh, over wrap or freezer bag that has ever touched a product. So um, we spend a ludicrous amount of money on quality assurances for, from environmental monitoring systems that monitor uh, temperature, humidity, uh, particle counts in real time. Um, we certify our biological safety cabinets in our clean room regularly for, um, you know, viable particles and non-viable particles in the air. Um, so there is, it, it's, it's, I would uh, compare it even more sophisticated than a pharmaceutical manufacturing or a compounding pharmacy just because of the uh, a level of detail and the, the, the metrics and the audit points throughout the system. Um, that are involved. So, 
um, you know, that's good. And then I think with us being relatively newer, not 25 years old, um, like some of our competitors, is that um, we, we've implemented newer technologies. So software-based platforms, newer equipment, uh, newer design, new standard operating procedures that gives us real uh, operational efficiencies. One word that really kind of tripped me off. Um, you said we spend ludicrous amounts of money on yeah. quality. Yeah. Um, so, and let me, let me. Well, I, I'm, what, what would happen if you left out ludicrous? Then it wouldn't be my, my words, you know. Um, this is why it's, it's ludicrous, because when you look at the um, increase in cost to the patient for what we invest in these quality systems and operating procedures, it makes it, um, it, it makes it, it makes it, exponentially more expensive with these with these costs and expense that we invest in the lab so but how um, do you estimate the downside cost if of getting it wrong there I think a better question is is there ways to make it much 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 less expensive to implement quality standards um, throughout a throughout a laboratory manufacturing system so I'd be interested to um, sit down and talk with you about that on how you can really drastically lower the cost of quality systems for cell therapy, particularly. Another question here in the middle. Thank you for your presentation. Seems like um, a significant long-term financial commitment for a young family that's just starting up. Do you understand who your demographic is uh, that's buying the private core bank, court bank, and what's motivating them? Is it, is it um, protecting their children's health? Is it protecting their parents' health, their grandparents? Mm -hmm. So, um, great question. So the target market is not just mom and dad, but it's also grandparents, uh, aunts and uncles, friends that wanna put it on the gift registry. So um, we have about actually 17 uh, to 20, between 17 and 20% of our patients are uh, Medicaid patients. Um, and part of that is we offer in-house financing. So interest-free, you know, they, they put a you know, $300 deposit down, they pay $100 a month for however many months. And we customize those to make it um, affordable for everybody. Because we feel like everybody should have this option. And I think the motivation you know, for a grandparent is to protect their grandchildren and children. I think for an expecting parent um, is to protect their, their children. So I think the overarching focus is protecting other family members. It's not that intrinsic um, self-motivational factors, but understanding the target market is, you know, we really uh, have three target markets, one direct to consumers, two through the privately owned OBGYN practices, and three through these large healthcare networks. Um, and so each of those we're trying to develop simultaneously, each with its own sales cycle, um, to give us kind of a more dynamic approach. Question in the center. So, okay, so I've done this. I have three kids, and 17 years ago, long before you probably thought about it, I uh, did cryocell. Mm -hmm. $75 a year is what it cost. Um, I'm in on kid one over $2,000 now, because at the time it was probably an $800 procedure. Um, I have an eight year old and the initial startup cost dropped by kid number three, but it's still $75 a year. What's your revenue model? Um, it's similar to what you pay. So there's the upfront fee and then the long-term storage fee. Um, and the interesting thing is that the value of cord blood goes up over time. So the number of people in your family that can benefit from the cord blood increases. The number of diseases and applications for the cord blood stem cells also increases. Um, and then the likelihood of your family members developing a disease or an injury that could use those stem cells also increases. So I think you're making a, a tremendously wise um, investment uh, for your what family. What do you cost? <laughs> okay, uh, 2300 for the blood and $175 a year for the uh, long-term storage. And once again, it comes down to our competitive advantage. What makes us unique and different is multiple containers. So CryoCell, put all your stem cells in one container. We'll put it in anywhere from 
uh, two to eight, depending on Can you tell me the volume. upfront cost again? Is $2,300. Yeah, it's $400 at CryoCell now and $75 a month, and they've been doing it for 19 years. Um, actually, <laughs> um, I, I don't believe that that's their current price. Oh, well, it was when I had my last child, but yeah. I think, and I, I think the marketing plan is really about the patient, so I found out about it in the OBGYN office. I'm in the medical field as well. So I'm, I think as long as patients are still having to pay for this, you're gonna have to market to the patients. I agree. Question here in the middle. So my question uh, ties into that one, and that is, you know, companies incentivize workers to not smoke and they offer them discounts on health benefits. Insurance companies charge higher premiums for smokers. So have you thought about going towards a market incentive thing with the insurance companies? I'm not talking regulation, I'm not a fan of overregulation, but you know, it seems to me that if we can do this and we have less diseases, then it's in the public good and it'll lower overall health costs. Yeah, and I think um, that is the direction of the, of the market is going, if you just take one case scenario, um, cerebral palsy is in clinical trial right now. Um, it costs on average about $2 million uh, per life to treat a child with cerebral palsy. Okay, address direct costs associated. Um, the instance of cerebral palsy, if you took the CDC numbers for the instance times everybody paying $2,300 for the cord blood um, is about $700,000. So they could save $1.3 million by uh, proactively saving everybody's cord blood as a treatment option for those patients. Now obviously it's not going to completely eliminate uh, any pre or post um, cost, but could it drastically reduce them? And that's just one single application, one single disease condition. So um, we believe that eventually everybody will save their cord blood tissue and plasma drive stem cells and, and biologics for that reason. Question here in the front. I may have missed this, but uh, which year did you um, handle your first customer's cord blood? And what's your... Uh, total en enrollment currently? Yeah, good questions. Um, we started in 2013, and we have uh, less than 1,000 units banked right currently. And our capacity um, right now for our lab is about 20 units per day. So this subject is a little bit new to me, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious um, if I understood it correctly. If you were to store my... Um, blood essentially when I was born. As I age and I encounter different health issues, what you're saying is that those stem cells that were saved at that time could help treat me because at that point in aging, I'm not able to regenerate certain things. Is that so, kind of the gist? So, and a great question. See, everybody in the room has stem cells in our body. So what is aging? Uh, aging is degradation of our organs and tissues on a cellular level faster than we can repair, rebuild, or regrow them. So why do we die? We die because we run out of stem cells. And so, um, logically, if we um, have a, a disease or condition that we can regenerate uh, an organ or a tissue, then that's a good thing. That will either increase the, the quality of life or shift the aging curve. And so, um, not, now with science and technology, it's not just if you had stored your stem cells when you were young, but now it's becoming, if you, if you store them now, what can they do? So adipose tissue, you know, we all have a little bit extra that we wouldn't mind putting in a freezer somewhere, right? And so when you're in a car accident and have traumatic um, whatever trauma, we'll say, is not the best time to go and extract stem cells um, to develop a cellular ther therapy product. And so that we see the direction of taking adult stem cells, either from our own bone marrow or from our cord blood is technically an adult stem cell, and then using it later in life, either for yourself or for uh, a member of your family. We, we're just about out of time. Grant, I believe you had one more quick question. So one of the things that we're uh, kind of just going back and forth on is um, it seems as though this would take an exceedingly high amount, almost a, maybe a ludicrous amount of money in order to get this off the ground, right? And then based on existing revenue models, we're probably somewhere below ludicrous. 
how many rounds of funding have you have you gone through in order to get to this point? And I mean, have we established break even and trajectory? Just kind of interested. So, uh, my wife and I started this company in 2012. Um, I thought I was going to go to medical school, become a physician. Um, I in college, I had a construction company that I sold. So we took that round of funding and put our medical school money into starting a cell therapy manufacturing um, company. And so that sustained us for, for a very long period of time. Um, so a, a couple, we were, had everything operational, we'd proven the concept, and we were generating revenue. And we actually partnered with um, an investment group out of Kansas City um, to put a funding round into Core 23. And so to date, we have that one round, um, and then currently have a, are opening a, another round of funding in Taurus. If you are so able, could would you disclose that group because we we want Kansas City to know there's money here? Yes, um, I am happy to disclose the group, and I think they're incredible people. Um, is Mid American Angels, um, and Rick Vaughn and his whole team are phenomenal. Um, and, and in conjunction with the Women's Capital Connection Group. So not to leave them out equally as important and equally as engaged. All right, so now for the classic One Million Cups question, what can we as a community do to help you? I would say help us help you, okay? <laughs> in, in that, let's, let's lay down our preconceived notions. Let's open our mind to learn something new and challenge conventional wisdom. Can we allow ourselves to change and adapt and learn and grow um, a little bit better, a little bit faster? Are there things that we can do together um, that will improve your quality of life? And um, the reality is we could, we could have all the technology in the world, but if we don't partner with patients and grandparents and moms and dads um, and people that understand and are willing to educate themselves about these things, then uh, we can't do anything. So just keep an open mind. Thank you. All right, so that's all we got for this week. Uh, good luck to our pipeline fellows presenting tomorrow. Um, if you have nothing to do today, or if you can get out of what you're doing today, make it down to the Sprint Accelerator. And that's it. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you next week. Appreciate it.